Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Elm Street Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. We are so glad you have chosen to join us today as we worship the Lord together in the house of God. Today, as we worship, I want to encourage you to think about the incredible majesty of God as the creator of everything. He is the giver of life and the reason we have breath in our lungs to live another day. For those of you watching on Facebook, welcome. We are so glad you have joined us. Please sign in on the comment section, and if you have a prayer request or need to be contacted, let us know here as well. And we have a few announcements today. Um, Pastor Kathy continues her vacation. She will return on September 3rd. Do we have any other announcements? Okay. Called to worship, God calls us to service rather than honor. God calls us to love the unknown rather than the familiar. We come to this time of worship trusting in the grace of Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The invocation prayer, Holy God, you alone are worthy of honor and praise. Open our eyes to see the world as you see it. Give us the wisdom to witness your presence in all people. Transform us in love. Grow us in our faith. Call us to love with a full heart and to share your promises with all people. Amen. Opening prayer is found in the blue hymnal, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, page 496. <laughs>
Please be seated. So it says in our bulletin this morning that we'll have an Old Testament story, which took me by surprise because I didn't know that that was going to be there. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you, who are your favorite Old Testament people? Moses. Moses. Okay. Job. Who? Job. Job. All right. Noah. Noah. Moses, yes, Hamer wore the shirt today for Moses. Anybody else? Favorite people? I guess no one chose Adam and Eve. <laughs> Pastor Kathy has been giving us stories over the past few weeks. Who did she talk about? Elijah, okay. Anybody else that's your favorite in the Old Testament? All right, well, we got a few. So that is our story today. You have stories that you know about these people that you hold in your heart or learned in Sunday school. So those are the stories from the Old Testament. So let us move on. Larry, we'll have your call to confession now. You're up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> call to confession. God invites us to mutual love, but to find that mutually, you must release our need for honor, our desire for privilege. In humility, let us seek forgiveness, trusting in the promises of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Please join me in the confessional. Merciful God, God forgive, forgive us for going to exalt ourselves and mock the humble. We, we choose, choose to, to believe, believe we are self-sufficient rather than trust in your strength. Craig. Open, Open us to your spirit that we might serve all people you know, without regard, regard to the outcome. Devoting, Devoting ourselves to your, your honor alone, alone. We, we pray in, in Jesus' name. name. Amen. Amen. God rejoices when we repent and return offering us finest wheat and honey from the rock to sustain us in new life. Rejoice, for you have been reconciled to God and to one another. With joy, seek the honor of God's service. Amen. Invitation to the offering. God, give us more grace that we can ever earn and sustain us in ways we cannot imagine. With a spirit of generosity, let us freely offer ourselves and our gifts to the world. We will now receive our morning offering. Prayer of dedication and thanksgiving, please join me. 
God of grace, we give thanks for your faithfulness to us. We give thanks for the hope in us. We rejoice in the knowledge of your unending grace, in the light of your mercy, and confidence in your love. We dedicate these offerings and offer ourselves to you. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is Luke 14, 1, 7 through 14. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. When he noticed how the guests picked their places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited you, both of you, will come and say to you, Give this person your seat. Then humility, you will take the seat, least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his hope, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. In our prayer of illumination this morning, God of wisdom, open us to the work of your spirit that we may hear and faithfully respond to your holy word. Amen. And our sermon hymn this morning is hymn number 492, Spirit of the Living God. And you may remain seated if you wish. You don't have to stand for this one.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. So this morning we heard a scripture lesson which Larry read for us and it contained two parables that Jesus shared with hosts and guests at a meal in the house of a prominent Pharisee. The Jesus of Luke's gospel I found as I was looking through commentaries on this um, particular scripture message has a strong interest in eating. There are more references to eating and at banquets and being at a table in Luke than in any other of the Gospels. I was like, oh, okay, that fits with me. <laughs> we all don't mind being at that table. Um, here we find Jesus at a table with a large group of people. As is his habit, Jesus is teaching while everyone else is eating. Jesus isn't particularly interested in this passage in the food being served, but what he's really interested in are the people who are around the table. So first, he talked to the guests, and he reminded them of the advice from the Proverbs, which said, do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of, the of a noble. Now, while this was practical social advice um, for his listeners, it carried with it a reminder that people present at the table belong to God, not to Rome. When we're at the lower place, we aren't just to be noticed so that we can go up higher, nor are we miserable there and letting everyone know by our facial expressions that we really don't belong here. There's something wonderful in being content in whatever place God has put us. Now, Jesus had no intention in, these, uh, in this scripture of letting his host off the hook. And when it came to table etiquette, he wanted to let them know about it in the kingdom of God. And Jesus said to him, you are inviting the wrong people by including only your friends, family, and those who can advance your status. You're no better than these guests who are fighting over the best seat in the house. You're trying to make yourself look good by surrounding yourself with important people while you ignore the ones who should be enjoying your hospitality. A host is to invite the least likely of guests and the guest is simple to simply to accept every invitation and not presume to define it or their place within it. The one who issues the invitation has the final say about the ranking of the guests. As we accept Christ's invitation to join him at the table in the kingdom of God, we must admit that we're only there by grace. We don't deserve such grace and we aren't any better than anyone else because of it. Taking our place at the bottom of the table where we know we belong, if we're really honest, allows us to respond in joy when Jesus, our host, taps us on the shoulder and says, what are you doing down here? Come on up and sit with me. What might Luke 14 have to say about us and in, in the church that we attend here? I've noticed something exceptional that's been happening over the past, well, since we've reopened from COVID. Holding our coffee hour in our vestry back here and sitting in a large circle has given us the opportunity to talk in a way that I didn't always see in Fellowship Hall. We have the chairs set up in a circle. We can all see each other. We can all take part in a conversation. We seem to be building our community in a way that each of us can share and see each other and everyone is welcome and no one is excluded. So that's my information on our scripture reading this morning. And I'm probably gonna drive him crazy with the camera because I'm gonna move. <laughs> but I wanna move away from the host and the guests and I wanna talk about the table. 
Jesus sat around many different tables in many different homes on his journey, and he ate, and he told stories, and he prayed with the people around the table. The table is a gathering place in most of our houses. We sit around it with our family, with our friends, with our guests, with visitors, and it's a place, I feel, of comfort, conversation, and, of course, food. There's many kinds of tables, if you think about it. There are the kinds, like in my dining room, I have a table that I can expand because I can put a leaf in the middle of it. What other kind of tables do you have? Can you think of? What kind? A coffee table. A drop leaf table. A marble table. Ooh. A card table, a picnic table, and I thought of things like, you know, a pub table or a high top table. I don't, that shouldn't give many of you pondering on why I would say that. Um, and some tables are necessary for community meals. They have to be long tables with many chairs. Think back to the time when we um, were able to offer our, our simple suppers. They were long tables, fit eight, ten people around the table. Many of you went to the public house community meals. What were those tables like? Big, round. You got to sit with either people you knew or people you didn't know. And a lot of us struck up conversations and got to meet the people who were around those tables. What happens around the tables at your house? What do you do at your table? Conversations. Conversations. Read the paper. paper. Blessings. Blessings. Watch TV. TV. Okay. Of course, we all eat around our table. (laughs) Correct? I thought of things such as organizing our lives, planning events. Um, completing paperwork, doing taxes, maybe. (laughs) And some of us may use our tables to cool the baked goods that we've made or the canning foods that we've put together. Lots of purposes for those tables. Next question, who sits around your table? Family, friends, Neighbors, people we invite in to come in. Son and grandchild. Grandchild. Okay. And who sits where? Oh, the head of the table, the head of the household, the father. Perhaps you have a seat that is just your seat. I know in our family we have the, our, the father <laughs> sits at one side of the table. Where does mom sit? Or the person who's doing the cooking? She never sits. Closest to the kitchen. That was my answer. That's where the mom usually is. And no, not over there. Okay. (laughs) If you have children and they come with their spouses, do they sit next to their spouse? Or do they sit across the table from their spouse? Across the table, okay. At holidays, how many of you have, perhaps, maybe, a children's table? Sometimes we have to set up an extra one because we have too many to go around our table. And it was so great when you got to the age where you could sit at the adult table instead of the children's table. Well, recently, um, I was told about a book um, that I want us to share and I want to share with you. And coincidentally, when I began reading this book, and you'll see why, I was sitting out on the front steps of my house, because that was where it was cool. There was a nice breeze on one of those breezy days. days. And the name of the book is called The Turquoise Table, and it's by Kristen Schnell. And the subtitle says, Finding Community and Connection in Your Own Front Yard. 
The author, Kristen Schnell, is an established speaker. She's a blogger on subjects of food, faith, and hospitality. She lives in Austin, Texas with her husband, and she has four children. And the first thing that jumped out at me when I started reading this book was that there are some truths about today's society, today's culture. And the first truth was we all live in busy, hectic, in a busy, hectic culture. The second one was that handwritten letters and talking on the phone, talking on the phone are foreign to our children. The third one is that we are heavily connected to our calendar. We have work schedules, we have volunteer commitments, we have school meetings, we may have soccer practices, we may have band concerts. And it was fun in here because she had a little quiz that you could take. And it says, do you rule your calendar or does your calendar rule you? Take this quiz to see how much, how you're spending your time and energy. And these are all yes, no answers. Looking at my calendar stresses me out. There's no empty space. I enjoy getting together with friends, but when I look at the calendar, the first available date is over a month out. I have a hard time saying no and end up overcommitting myself. No matter what I do, it seems every minute of the day is scheduled for something. I often wish I had more time for things I enjoy. Everything on my calendar is good and important. And I feel powerless over my time and my commitments. And there's a few other questions in here, and then you get to rate yourself. You get a point for every yes that you said. And you can see if you belong to the frazzled club. The fourth truth that I found in this book is that we tend to text out a lot of messages to people, sending texts. And the last one was that sometimes we can only quickly wave to a friend in passing. How you doing? And we're off. Maybe we're not waiting for an answer even sometimes. Kristen struggled to find a way back to a table that would welcome people without feeling frazzled and over the task. And one day she found a way to go to a conference in Texas and as she was in the conference, she was kind of at that breaking point where she, she pleaded with God to help her find a way to open her home and her life to others and how to build a community. And her answer came up in a documentary that came up on the, the big screen at that point in the conference. And what she saw on this documentary at first, it showed an elderly woman walking along on cobbled streets and this woman, her name was Ludmilla. She was 84 years old. She was a widow, and she lived in Prague. And she survived two totalitarian regime, regimes and lived in the most atheist, atheistic country in Europe. But outside of her tiny apartment, she put a small bronze plaque that said, Embassy of the Kingdom of Heaven. And every day, she opened her house to friends and to strangers who needed to talk. Most of them found her by word of mouth, and her offerings to them were very simple. She may have some tea, she may have some cookies for food, but she had a quiet and genuine way about her. She only needed to listen and to pray with them. And Ludmilla modeled how simple hospitality could be through her ministry of being present. The light bulb went off in Kristen's head. The idea she came up with was so simple and it hit home, and it hit home with me as well. A picnic table set up in her front yard. Front and center, taking all those activities that happened in the backyard and putting them in the front yard. Now remember, she was a mom of four children 
And a lot of times they would do their homework in the backyard, they might do arts and crafts projects, they may have dinner in the backyard, and she said, let's move that all to the front yard. We're moving out front. Kristen could build community in her no own neighborhood without having to worry. <laughs> if her house was clean and orderly, you don't want people to see that mess. Dishes in the drainer. She didn't have Wi-Fi out there, so she couldn't use her phone or her computer or be texting somebody, and she had to focus on being present with anyone who stopped by. She'd bring a book with her sometimes or a journal that she would write in in case, you know, for the times that she was alone. But, you know, this book wouldn't have been written if she had a lot of time alone. And why turquoise? She bought a plain picnic table and put it in her front yard. But she decided that it was kind of plain. It needed something. So she asked all of her friends and everyone gave her suggestions and she came up with a plan to paint it turquoise. In many cultures, turquoise symbolizes friendship. Good choice. Now, Christine, or Kristen, used this table regularly. She put aside on her busy calendar a time when she was going to sit out in that front yard. And think about sitting out in your own front yard. I see people walking by my front yard many times, walking their dogs or just, you know, walking themselves, um, pushing a baby carriage. I don't know these people. When we first moved to Charlton, um, our neighbors, and we all had younger children, we would all get together at least once every summer. And during that time, we had themed summer cookouts. Like once we all chose a country and we had to bring food from that country and share it with all of our neighbors. And that was the time that I got to meet all of my neighbors, old ones that I knew already and new ones, because what we did was we put invitations in everyone's mailbox and invited everyone in the neighborhood to come. Other gatherings that I thought about that went along with this whole idea was um, at Camp Wellville. This was the camp that I went to from the age of eight and through high school with my family. It was a family camp. And every Monday morning, there was a coffee hour. Now, mostly moms and dads went because as a kid, you didn't want to sit around and drink coffee with old people. But it was a time to meet the fellow campers who was there um, it was a time to renew friendships for people that you hadn't seen since last summer, or maybe it was a time to get to meet new people. And this is where we could exchange camp stories. If any of you have been to camps, sometimes you have some very interesting stories. I remember when, that type of thing. And it let the new people also know what the camp was all about. And then I thought about gatherings that we have at our house. And they happen in our backyard because it's big. It can accommodate all the guests that we offer, that we, that we invite. Of course, only those invited. What would happen if we moved our gatherings to the front lawn? My husband thinks I'm crazy. Kristen's book planted an idea of adding a table to my front lawn. From inside my house, like I said, I can see many of my neighbors walking by. I might be out front, you know, working on the garden or walking around, and I might wave to them, but that's about all the time that I have to see them. Could I build community this way and pass the time getting to know more about them? Maybe offer a place to sit, a glass of water, share something about ourselves? David? I'm going to do this. <laughs> Could we do this as a community building table for those who pass by our church? Romans 12:13 says, "Take every opportunity to open your life and home to others." Could this be our opportunity? Now I gave some of you 
papers, and I know I missed a couple, so I want to pass these out. These are quotes that came out of this book, not quotes, well, quotes that came out of the book that I'm talking about, the turquoise table. Some of them I've used in my sermon this morning, but some of them I didn't. And I think some of them may speak to each one of you. And I think the one that I like is community is a basic need of humanity and the table, all tables, should be a place of inclusion. And what I'd like to do is, you know, have you look at these and during coffee hour, maybe we can talk about which one struck you. Because I always have that problem, like I read something or I see something and it just strikes me and I'm like, yeah, I got to do this. And I will. This fall, I'll be leading a book study here using this book, The Turquoise Table, so that we can build on this idea. And I hope that many of you will join in this book study. I think it is something that we can do as a community, and we can reach out, get outside of the four walls, and be out in the community, and see who we can meet see what we can do for someone outside of these walls. Let us pray. Lord, I love that you inspire people in their time of need. I love that you give us these ideas, thoughts, and help us to work through them to get to the place where we build community. In your name I pray. Amen. All right. So we are coming to our time of joys and concerns. Do we have some that you would like us to pray about, Larry? Thank you. Um, for Barbara, okay. Sue? Sue's sister Pat, okay. Jeff? Jeff's friend Mark and family. Althea? Great. Louise Walker, who is home and very happy to be there. Comfortable place. I want to offer up a, a prayer for my son Sean and his friend Chris. Um, Chris is taking on a big challenge. He is walking the long trail, which goes from the bottom of Vermont to the top of Vermont, 200 and something miles. And my son Sean has met him this weekend so that he can walk with him for a couple of days, or hike with him. I shouldn't say walk, it's hiking. Um, so I want to send out good, good wishes, feelings, have a wonderful time for both the guys. Anybody else? Kathy? Oh, so prayers for watchful neighbors who found something before it got worse. All right, please pray with me. Lord, we bring before you these people, friends, family, neighbors, who are in need of your prayers, your hand to guide them, to be with them. Be with Barbara, 
and Pat and Mark and his family, be with Louise Walker and her family, be with Chris and Sean. And we are thankful for neighbors who are in the right place at the right time to protect us. In your name, we pray for these people and we take a moment of silent prayer for the things that we were not lifted up in public but are in our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Please join me in the intercessory prayers. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, God of mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, you call us to relinquish the cares and concerns of our lives to you, so that we may serve you in perfect freedom. Hear us as we bring before you the petitions of our hearts and minds. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We offer our prayers for the universal church. May our words and actions bring honor to your name and teach us true humility. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We offer our prayers for the needs of the world. May peace pervade in all places of conflict and violence. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We offer our prayers for those who suffer from sickness of mind, body or spirit, and all those who care for them. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have died, who now worship in the presence of Christ, and those who will die today. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you call us to follow you with faithfulness even when it challenges our relationships and the values of our culture. Help us to release our fears, nurture us in your ways, and sustain us as we seek your peace. We ask this for your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in the closing hymn, and found in the blue hymnal, page 151. Him a promise.
May the God of mystery take you to unexpected places. May the God of humility teach you to serve without pride. May the God of wisdom inspire your work in the kingdom and the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier be with you now and always. Please join us in our threefold amen. Welcome to enjoy the postlude or coffee hours being served.